Welcome to Square One, powered by FinTech TV. The Indian startup ecosystem has been on an absolute tear over the past decade. With the increased success of founders, ever more capital flowing into the ecosystem, and structural and cultural changes taking place across the entire country, India has never been more ripe for a promising technology future. Today, we chatted with one of India's most accomplished founders, Gunal Pale. Gunal co-founded Snapdeal 13 years ago and continues to lead the company as CEO today. He's also started Titan Capital with the Snapdeal co-founder, Rohit Bansal. Ganal, Rohit, and the team have invested in over 200 companies in India over the past few years. Today, we pick Ganal's brain on building, scaling, and investing in many of India's most promising startups. Welcome, Ganal. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Rumi. Yeah, Kunal, it's a pleasure to have you on today. You know, I've learned so much from you, and I'm, I'm glad our audience is going to be able to share on the same perspective. You know, in today's discussion, we'll focus on what's going on in the Indian startup ecosystem. But to set the context, let's first talk about the mindset shift, you know, of being a startup founder from when you started Snapdeal to today's founders. You've framed it previously as, you know, startups are now seen as a solution to building a great country versus 10 years ago, you know, where it was seen as 20 somethings, you know, dabbling. Just unpack that shift for us and, and let's set the context. Yeah, um, again, great to be here, Romain. Um, you know, when, when we started our business 13 years ago, startups weren't really a positive word or even a phrase that was well understood in India. Uh, I remember I'd, I'd come back to India in 2007 uh, after uh, my uh, visa was rejected uh, in the US so that's what brought me back to uh, back to India, but you know us startup uh, founders were seen to be strugglers and not creators. This is the fundamental thing that has changed in India over the last decade. And the founders of startups and their teams are now seen as creators of India in in 2021 and beyond. Not people who are struggling through life or uh, were adversely selected into entrepreneurship as a career path. Um, the, additionally, I think the support that one is seeing in the ecosystem, whether it is from the investor network, expanding the government leaders, celebrating startups, like I think not a month goes by when the Minister of Commerce of India or the Prime Minister of India is not appreciating the impact the startups are having in our country. It is an unusual thing, if you think about it, for a country as large as ours, with the number of issues we have as a, as a nation, for the leaders of the country to step up and continuously keep celebrating startups, it's very encouraging for, uh, for the talent pool at large. And speaking of talent, there's a huge base of very talented professionals and recent graduates who are now preferring to work at startups than traditional companies, even the multinational companies. All of these are nothing short of tectonic plate shifts compared to when we had started our business. I remember, um, even convincing someone who had just recently graduated out of college and had no job um, and was expecting you know, only $500 or $1,000 a month of salary, even they were not able to convince their parents to join our business then, even though we were offering you know, a better salary and we were obviously assuring that, look, we are good people with good backgrounds and committed to this business, but that's not the case anymore. Um, also, I think what has structurally changed in India is that the entire early stage investment ecosystem has grown so massively. And I often say that the first money into startups is often the most important given it determines whether that egg even hatches or not. And I uh, recall like 10 years ago, there was barely an early stage ecosystem, investment ecosystem in India. Uh, we had maybe all of 12, 13 VCs and almost no angel investors. You literally had to go to a wealthy uncle or a wealthy stranger and, and lean on their kindness. Um, so, so I think overall we've seen a, a tremendous shift in India over the last decade uh, from a talent standpoint, from a, the, the ability of, of the government to evangelize the startup ecosystem, um, from a capital availability standpoint, uh, uh, everything has changed in the last 10 years, almost nothing is the same. And, and it's very exciting. The future looks very, very optimistic. Yeah, I think outside in as an investor in a few late stage growth businesses in India, it's been eye popping for me as an outsider just to internalize how quickly the country is changing. You, you mentioned a lot of kind of the elements of what contributes 
you know, to the ecosystem's growth, right? Um, government inclusion, additional angel investors, capital coming in, talent coming in. There's also a secondary bucket, uh, which is just a tailwind that the country is rising, right? Uh, or, or riding, right? So things like a rising consumer class, you know, internet penetration, et cetera. Give us a little bit more perspective on that latter bucket, especially for, you know, global investors that are outside of India. What are some of those elements that are contributing, you know, to, to India's ecosystem? Okay. Yeah, I think there are, it's a confluence of many tailwinds, uh, Romain, uh, that are at play that have suddenly come, come to be at play over the last three, four years. I think first and foremost, this started with uh, the geo-led 4G revolution in 2017, 2016, where now fast forward 2016 to present day in the last four or five years, we have nearly a billion smartphone users with the cheapest data on the planet. Just think about it, right? Like uh, 10 years ago, we had maybe 50 million internet users in India. We used to always debate in our ecosystem, are there 50, are there 75? Like, there were a lot of nuanced discussions about whether the number is uh, 50 or 75 or 100. Now nobody debates that. Everyone knows that we are in and around a billion smartphone users with the cheapest data in the world. That has very significant implications for any internet business uh, in the country. Um, I think the second factor, Romain, is the rising aspirations. You alluded to that as well. You know, because of the access to information that exists for all these billion smartphone users, uh, they are looking at Facebook, they're looking at what the Bollywood stars are wearing and how they're living their lives and how they are cutting their hair. Um, they are reading about successful entrepreneurs, uh, both in India, outside India. They are learning about what's going on outside of their villages, outside of their towns, outside of their cities in, in ways that they never did before. And all of this is tantamounting to rising aspirations for um, India at large, and particularly for, for, the, for the aspiring class, the, the middle income, lower to middle income uh, classes of India. Uh, there is also abundance of entrepreneurial talent. I think as a society, we have gone through tough period um, in the last many decades, pre-independence, post-independence. And there is this survivalistic instinct that exists in our country. And that is being channeled into an, an entrepreneurial uh, uh, talent that many are exhibiting in the country right now. We have hundreds, if not thousands of engineering colleges uh, and, and the talent coming out of those engineering colleges is now being employed by many of these startups and many of them are actually starting their own companies. Uh, there is a, a significant amount of growth in the number of high quality internet-based services that, are, that have now won the hearts and minds of tens of millions of customers. And in a way, the internet services in India, whether it's a food delivery app, whether it's a, you know, a ride hailing app, whether it's an e-commerce business, they are in a way creating a socio-economic equalization in the country where whether I'm buying something from, um, you know, from Snapdeal or someone in a village is buying something from Snapdeal, we're actually providing equally good service to both, right? Uh, On-time delivery, low prices, uh, no questions asked returns. And same applies for a food delivery company, right? Whether I order a $5 burger or someone else orders a $5 burger, everyone will get the same service. And that type of social economic equalization has not existed traditionally in uh, you know, non-internet uh, businesses uh, offline in India. Um, you know, we've backed about 200 startups in India yep. and continue to be amazed by the quality of founders. I think there is now tremendous amount of tribal knowledge in the ecosystem over the last 10 years because many, many companies have gotten created, some have worked, some have not worked, but there's a vibrant ecosystem in India now where there's a lot of exchange of ideas, um, execution has improved, uh, talent cross-pollination has improved. So at least our goal is to be as helpful as we can to the next generation of founders and increase their chances of success. But irrespective, I think just the next 10 years are, uh, even the next 20 years, I would say, are going to be incredibly exciting for the startup ecosystem in India. Much more on the impact when we come back.
want to use this to transition a little bit. But Zomato just went public. Uh, there's a slew of other companies on the docket to go public soon in India. Uh, and in parallel, a number of significant growth rounds are getting done, right? Um, and this is, this is all very new for India, right? It's going to unleash a number of second order effects, more capital in the ecosystem, more investors, and more founders. Now, how do you think about the current IPO and late stage growth ecosystem in India? And, and maybe for global investors, you know, what are some of the elements that from your experience as a participant in the ecosystem aren't getting as much headlines or aren't being as appreciated, uh, you know, which may be interesting perspective for global investors? Yep, absolutely. I think for the last decade, um, if you are a participant in the Indian startup ecosystem as a founder or an investor, or a media person, all you've been hearing is uh, how will people eventually exit uh, these companies? Yep. Given, uh, you know, traditionally, India hasn't had a lot of depth when it comes to strategic buyers or domestic strategic buyers who can do large acquisitions or who want to do large acquisitions in this space. They have often restricted themselves to buying either distressed companies or acqui hires or, or uh, just generally smaller acquisitions. And traditionally in India, public companies weren't amenable, um, uh, public, sorry, public markets weren't amenable to uh, unprofitable public companies. Uh, however, with the current slew of tech IPOs led by the Zomato IPO uh, last week, what they have done is to break open the dam and remove the ceiling that has existed for many years. Uh, that, you know, it was obviously an artificial ceiling but the ceiling has definitely lifted. And in some ways, the circle of life for the Indian tech companies has now completed. Similar to what has been going on in the US for the last 25 years and China in the last 10, 15 years, India will now see the same established trend of seed to IPO repeat over hundreds and hundreds of companies in the coming years. Now, uh, you know, to the second question, uh, Romain, I think a lot of attention is right now going to the consumer stories um, because these are companies with millions or tens of millions of customers who have captured the you know, hearts and minds, the imagination of consumers and the media at large. So they're getting a lot of attention. A lot of the companies going public right now are those who have been traditionally large advertisers. Uh, and as I said, have uh, you know, very large uh, customer bases. So there's a lot of attention around them. However, there are a lot of very high quality software SaaS companies in India that don't get the same level of um, maybe consumer oriented coverage, but are otherwise very high quality businesses mm -hmm. and are often even profit making. I expect that these companies will also do quite well when they go public in India as Indian public market investors do appreciate uh, profitability a bit more than maybe uh, US public market investors in tech. Also the Indian public markets uh, have been big investors in the IT services companies for over 20 years, the likes of Infosys, Wipro, TCS. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, there is about $200 billion worth of IT services exports that Indian IT services companies do every single year. Right? So it's, it's a massive industry with you know, millions of employees across these companies. And I think most of the big companies in the world at the back end have an Indian IT services company supporting them or, or more than one. Um, SaaS companies out of India are essentially productized versions of these businesses. Over a period of time, there, is a, there will be a you know, multi-year or maybe even a multi-decade transition from services to products for these companies. And a lot of new startups have come up that are productizing a lot of the services that these companies have been selling to overseas clients for many years. I feel that this is going to be a very, very exciting trend where very lasting, enduring businesses will get built, which will also succeed on the public markets. Yep. Kunal, as, as, we, as we wrap up, I want to finish on a, on a lighter note with something you tweeted recently. Uh, you wrote, everything you own owns a little piece of you. You know, there's a corollary statement in the Gita, which adds to this, which is what we give sets us free. You and I have talked you know, about this idea at length of kind of purpose in life, the importance of having direction. Um, I want you to unpack the thought process behind that tweet. It was very recent. It was a day or two ago. I, I want you to unpack the thought process behind that and just how your perspective on purpose has matured you know, through the journey of Snapdeal. 
Yeah, um, actually the complete saying in Gita, um, uh, Romain, is what we take owns us, what we give sets us free. So, uh, you know, it does have a sublime message for founders out there raising capital. Um, but, you know, I've always thought about four things that matter most to me, um, which are health, family, freedom, and purpose. So over, you know, and, and if you were to just talk for a minute about these, you know, health, just exercise every day, eat healthy, eat less sugar, um, you'll be mostly fine. Uh, you know, some things you can't predict health-wise, but whatever you can do in your hands, if you do it, you'll be reasonably healthy. Um, you know, family I've seen, they, they just want your time. They want your undivided attention from time to time. And, and that's all they want from you. And oftentimes uh, we are not able to even give that, but just being conscious about that is important. Freedom, just don't do anything wrong uh, and you will have your freedom. Um, and then finally having a sense of purpose. So over a period of time, as your basic needs get met, uh, one does think more and more about purpose. One, one thinks about what is, uh, what keeps you going, what gets you bed out, of, uh, out of bed every day and not just troubleshooting and firefighting, but you know, what are you building? Uh, what is the impact that you're creating? Over a period of time, at least I've realized that I enjoy building businesses I enjoy supporting other founders in their journeys with capital, mentorship. And I really enjoy spending a lot of time with my family. So now I would say 95% of the time I spend uh, is split between these three things, right? Which is building our business, supporting other founders and with my family. And, and I think uh, uh, just to just having that purpose that I'm creating some impact every day of my life is, is whether directly or vicariously, at the same time ensuring that uh, one doesn't get lost only in the world of commercial pursuits is important. And which is why having control over one's time, the ability to spend unstructured and unscheduled time with your family, uh, with your parents, your wife, your kids, it's probably the most important joy one can have in life. So yeah. this freedom is probably the truest blessing that, uh, that, that I'm really happy about. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, I want to bring in Kavita, Kavita Gupta, the, the founder of FinTech TV. Kavita, you've been listening to the conversation. What's your, what's your question for Kunal? Um, first of all, I, I should say I didn't want this conversation to be over because both of you had such a riveting cross going on. Uh, Kunal, especially, uh, this is the first time I'm also realizing about the YouTube thing which you mentioned because some of the top podcasts from the country came and started saying we need to start producing content in Hindi. We need to, even like with ET coming and doing content in Hindi actually has woken up the whole digital platform places saying that your cell phone is actually massively in the hand of people where the medium is different. Um, I want to build up on that. And my question is me coming personally from a very early crypto blockchain adoption and looking at place in India where India is now not copying, as you said, initially it started with the mechanism of what's working out there. Let's copy the product in India and let's produce it. It has become one of the biggest forces. The founders from India producing products for Indians are now producing products globally in the blockchain crypto space. We have companies like Polygon, we have Instadab, which the products are completely global day zero. Um, how, how have you been, have you been tracking the space in India and what would be your view about it? Yeah, I think the, um, Kavita, the point is a valid one. Um, while we have seen some global products emerge out of India, in general, I would say we haven't really, I think we've gotten left behind a little bit on the crypto side. Uh, partly because um, you know every government everywhere in the world is taking their own calls uh, as to um, what their position on crypto is. The Indian government's taken a call. It, I think their position may evolve over a period of time, but at least as of right now, the position is that, look, uh, this is something we don't completely understand right now, and we want to watch it. Till then, we are going to put some uh, gatekeeping around it. And as a result, the amount of innovation that one would have seen around crypto, we haven't seen in India yet or the growth we haven't seen. That said, I feel around uh, blockchain, we'll see a lot of interesting opportunities in India. I'm seeing early signs of a lot of very interesting 
you know, NFT startups uh, come up in India, uh, which I always thought, you know, in India, people are, people want to do a lot of, uh, you know, physical product commerce traditionally, either build software or do physical product commerce. There's always been this per perception that, uh, you know, uh, will digital goods work in India? Will people pay for digital goods? But over a period of time, I'm seeing that that is surely uh, evolving. So the future around blockchain looks quite positive in India in general, especially when it comes to applications like NFT, et cetera. I think on the crypto side, particularly, uh, a lot depends on how the regulation evolves, uh, Kavita. No, this has been great. It's uh, it's so welcome to hear your perspective on the Indian ecosystem, you know, both as an entrepreneur and as an investor. I'm, I'm super personally excited for you on the next chapter of Snapdeal and, and really, I think, together to continue to watch you know, India as a country ascend. So thanks again for the time and, and you're welcome back anytime. Thank you, Romin, and thank you, Kavita. Thanks for having me, having me here.